Well, today was Roundup Sunday, and uh, I really appreciate all the food. Like Sam, I was unable to uh, eat anything for lunch, and I could only eat a small amount just a while ago. Got here and uh, ate some of it. Thank you for all you did. And we gave out uh, awards today for people who had the most authentic uh, Western attire, and we appreciate everybody working together on that. And uh, Sam's been doing a good job putting together the uh, importance of the Word of God, right? Amen. And um, so in the Sunday morning services, he'd been preaching on that. And my message tonight is on the, the Bible in the ballot box. I think if you're a genuine Christian, it'll affect the way you vote, just like it affects everything else in your life. And God's Word applies to every area of our lives, and the responsibility to vote is, of course, no exception. Now, if you were here in 2020, uh, I preached six messages, I believe, uh, on Sunday morning on how a Christian should vote. Now, to make sure that you don't get panicky, I'm not preaching all six of them tonight. <laughs> but I just condensed them into one message, and uh, it covered about 14 different subjects. And uh, interestingly, the positions of the candidates from both parties, Republican and Democrat, if you go to the websites, as I did to reconfirm, uh, they haven't changed appreciably in the last two years, except to get worse. And uh, so we, you know, the, what I'm preaching tonight is from the 2020 messages, but at the same time, it still covers the very same thing. So I want to summarize the series of messages in this one message and answer the question, how should a true Christian vote? So let's go to 1 Kings chapter 15, and we're going to see uh, kind of a foundation for this. 1 Kings chapter 15, and we'll begin reading in verses, uh, verse 1 and go through verse 5. 1 Kings chapter 15, the Old Testament has a lot to say about politics. They just don't use the word politics. Uh, the Bible talks about dinosaurs, but the word dinosaur didn't come into existence till the 19th century. So, um, now in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, reigned Abijam over Judah. Three years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Maacah, the daughter of Abishalom. And he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as the heart of David, his father. Nevertheless, for David's sake, did the Lord his God give him a lamp in Jerusalem to set up his son after him and to establish Jerusalem. Because David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord and turned not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. So basically what we have here is a picture of what's happening all through history politically, and that is you have some leaders that are wicked and evil, and that's all they do is push their agenda. And then you have some leaders that want to do what God wants done. They want to lead the nation in that direction. The psalmist said, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. So David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. So how should a genuinely saved person cast his ballot? And I say vote for the candidate who approves what God approves and who disapproves what God disapproves. So let's look at some of the areas that have to be considered. Number one, human life. Human life. In Genesis 127, God created human life in his own image, and the image of God is not a physical image, but if you go to the book of Ephesians, it's the capacity to understand the difference between righteousness and unrighteousness and to respond properly to righteousness. So God also established two distinct sexes, male and female, and confirmed that their union should be approved uh, by marriage. In Exodus 21, 22 through 23, aborting a fetus was considered taking a human life. And it hasn't been too long ago in the United States where there were a number of court cases where somebody killed a pregnant woman and the, ba the baby died as well and the person was charged with two murders, two murders. Since there is no timeline mentioned in the Exodus passage, the fetus is considered human at all stages of development. 
So God pronounces a special curse or a special judgment upon a nation that sheds innocent blood. And you can't get more innocent than an unborn baby. Here are some passages you can look at. Exodus 23, 7. Deuteronomy 19, 10. Deuteronomy 21, 9. Deuteronomy 27, 25. And Proverbs 6, 17 all indicate God's judgment on those who take innocent life. So you vote for the candidate who will protect babies from the slaughter that's being disguised as the freedom of health choice for women. Human life, that's one thing you need to look at in the candidate's platform. Number two, law enforcement. Law enforcement. Moses was given the Ten Commandments on Sinai, and afterwards he by applying those Ten Commandments to daily living, came up with, if you look in Psalm 119, it lists a lot of synonyms for the Word of God. Uh, he talks about statutes, principles, ordinances, and judgments. And people were to live by those guidelines when they came before Moses for judgment or before the judges that he appointed. They had to be judged by those guidelines. You see, God's absolutes were foundational to judging the behavior of his people and uh, not only toward each other, but toward the social context as well. In Romans 13, 1 through 7, the Apostle Paul, under Roman authority, advises full support for law enforcement, but he lists two things in that passage that the law must do in order to have our full support. Number one, it must reward and protect good. And number two, it must punish lawbreakers or those who are evil. Judeo-Christian law, of course, is foundational to what was called in England common law, and it seeks to protect the righteous and penalize the wicked. So vote for the candidate who will fund and support law enforcement in society. Another area of concern is self-defense. As you know, our firearms are historically recent. If you study the history of you know, firearms. According to the uh, PBS uh, TV series uh, put on uh, several years ago, the first record uh, recorded use of firearms was in 1364. By 1380, the handgun was known across all of Europe. By 1400, the matchlock was on the scene. So prior to firearms, what did people do to protect themselves? Well, I was reading through the Bible the other day, and there are no references to uh, um, handguns or rifles or shotguns. They used spears. Sometimes they would use clubs. Uh, sometimes they might even use a rock. They would use bows and arrows. They would use swords. Or any available device that could protect your own life and property. Therefore, the issue is not the gun. The issue is the right to defend your life and your property. That's what the real issue is. So if a candidate doesn't want you to defend your life and property, the issue is not the gun. One man put on Facebook the other day, he said, you know, he said, I've been listening to some of the Democrats talk about how guns are the problems. He said, he said I left mine with a box of shells on the table in the hall for a week, and it killed no one. <laughs> because the problem is not the gun. The problem is the human heart. Um, Franklin Graham said the other day, our real problem in America is the human heart. People need to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. So the right that the Constitution protects in the self or in the Second Amendment is the right to self-defense, to protect your life and property. God allowed his leaders in the Old Testament to defend themselves against their enemies. And so you need to look at the candidate running for office, and you need to find out if he approves what God approves and disapproves what God disapproves. Protection for life, liberty, and property is biblical. Exodus 17, 9, Moses sent Joshua to fight the Amalekites. Judges 1, 9, Judah was sent to fight the Canaanites. And in Numbers 32, 6, Moses rebuked those who refused to fight the enemies of Israel and left it up to the other tribes. So there are many biblical references to fighting the enemies 
of truth. Well, let me give you another area of concern. Number four, border control. And most people would think that borders are not even mentioned in the Bible, but they're mentioned a lot of times in the Bible. God made a covenant with Abram, and when he gave him that promise that he was going to give him a specific land, in Genesis 15, 18, he actually marked out the borders, <coughs> where the borders would be. And if you look at those borders in Genesis 15, 18, the, Arabian, the Arab nations right now are squatters. They're actually inhabiting land that was promised to the nation of Israel. Egypt had borders, Genesis 47, 21. Canaan had borders, Exodus 16, 35. Edom had borders, Numbers 20, 14. Moses even showed respect for borders. He wanted to go through the land of Edom and sent word to the king of Edom who refused to allow them to go through that land because he controlled his borders. So Moses took a different route and refused to uh, violate the border. Numbers 20, verse 17, and 20, 21, border control has always been important historically, except to those who are self-seeking politicians. Uh, Ezekiel, in his prophecies about the promised land, in Ezekiel 45, 1, called the borders of the promised land holy. Holy borders. So you vote for the candidate who approves what God approves and disapproves what God disapproves. Number five, what about taxation? Most of us are kind of chagrined about the fact that uh, recently they, we were told by the Democratic leadership they're going to hire 87,000 new IRS agents. They said won't be coming after the common man. but we'll be going after the people who have a lot more money. But most people don't realize that the very wealthy people in, in our country comprise less than 1% of the total population. So what about taxation? In God's word, as is true today, taxation is used both legitimately and illegitimately. The wrong usage is seen in the story of Rehoboam who went to Shechem to be made king. Jeroboam and the others went to him. They were the older men. They had seen how his father's taxing had hurt the country. They went to him and asked for taxation relief. What he did was call in his younger advisors who had the same lust for power that he did, and they told him to increase the taxes, and he sent word to the uh, populace, uh, 1 Kings 12, 1 through 15, and took the advice of the younger advisors and increased taxes on the people. Taxation. What about taxation? Well, properly used, what it is designed for is to provide for the government as it protects those who do good, according to Romans 13, 1 through 7, but as it punishes those who do evil. Improperly used, taxation takes money from those who earn the money and to give exorbitant pay raises to leaders for personal benefit. At Capernaum, for example, the disciples were confronted and said, why don't you and uh, Jesus pay taxes? And Jesus and the disciples did pay taxes. Remember the story of Jesus told Peter, go and catch a fish and look at his mouth? A lot of people say that that didn't really happen. I said, of course it happened. It didn't happen. It wouldn't be in the Bible if you've been listening to Sunday morning messages. The Old Testament kings levied taxes in order to carry out the responsibilities of government. Remember when the people cried, let us have a king like other nations? And Samuel came and told them, and says, well, you, you get ready for what that means. You're going to have to supply the military. You're going to have to pay the government officials. There's going to be taxation and everything. The power to tax. When we were fighting the state of Kentucky, our attorney told us the power to tax is the power to control. And the power to tax involves sharing in communal responsibility. And the power to tax involves supporting those who manage and oversee the responsibilities of society. So God doesn't disapprove of taxation. He approves of taxation, which is designed to carry out legitimate functions of government. So God's word can be protected and God's work can be protected 
according to Romans 13, 1 through 7. So when you vote, you pull the lever, vote for candidates who approve what God approves, but who disapprove what God disapproves. Number six, the military. I'm always amazed at the number of people who want to enjoy the freedom we have in this country, but have some kind of conscientious objection to fighting. I remember when I knew that God wanted me to preach, and I went down uh, to talk to the uh, military uh, fellow down there at the uh, Air Force uh, Enrollment Center, and he said, well, he said, if you are a pastor, you don't have to serve. And I said, well, I know that, but I didn't come down here not to serve. I was 17, so I had to get my dad's permission to sign you know, to get me to go in. And so I wanted to go in because I thought it was the right thing to do. Remember what Moses said to the children of Israel, the tribe that didn't want to go across and take the land? He said, why should you sit here while your brethren go to war? That was also the word that I sent out to all the pastors who refused to support us in our legal battle against the state of Kentucky. Why are you going to sit here while we go fight the battle? Are you going to want to enjoy the freedom we're fighting for? If you are, you should be picking up a sword. You should be fighting with us in this battle. So the military, all through the Old Testament, God required the 12 tribes to have fully well-trained and organized warriors to protect their lives and their possessions. While self-defense was the primary function, if you read in the Old Testament, primary function was to protect themselves from the enemy. But on occasion, God required offensive action in order to drive out idolatry. And he sent the people of Israel in to fight the battles. So legitimate taxation would fund both law enforcement and the military. God was credited with delivering Israel's armies in battle in Exodus 12, 17. Numbers 12, 9 uh, tells the people that were in the armies numbered by tribes. Each tribe's army flew a flag called a standard, Numbers 10, 14. And every time they camped, the area of the tribe where the camp was, the standard was there. And Deuteronomy 20, verse 9 refers to officers and captains who led the battle. The Apostle Paul himself referred to military imagery frequently when speaking of our spiritual battles and never, to the best of my knowledge, did he condemn military action. He used it as foundational for fighting the spiritual battles of the Christian life. So listen to the candidates. Do they approve what God approves and disapprove what God disapproves? Number seven, what about business? Regulating business. Right now, and also under the Obama administration, Severe restrictions were placed upon small businesses, and according to the National Association of Small Businesses, the number of small businesses going out of business during Obama and during the Biden administration uh, was at an all-time high. Business regulation. Um, remember when Joseph was sold into Egyptian slavery? He soon earned respect from Potiphar about how he handled Potiphar's assets. And Potiphar, we're told in Genesis 39, 3, was eleva elevated Joseph as overseer all, over all of Potiphar's assets, having the authority to reckon and to manage those assets. In Genesis 39, 11, Joseph was said to be responsible to do all of Potiphar's business. And business indicates carrying out deputyship, carrying out employment, and carrying out overall management and workmanship. So God approves hard work, but God disapproves laziness. Now business is used with reference to officers and judges, 1 Chronicles 26, 29. Business is used of Levites in 2 Chronicles 13, 10. So we have legal business, religious business. Second Chronicles 32, 31 uses business with reference to princes and ambassadors. There, there we have government business. 
And then in Psalm 107, 23, the word business relative is used relative to those who go down to the sea in ships. So there we have commercial or maritime business. But the Bible treats business as honorable, a holy enterprise that should honor God. Listen to these verses. Proverbs 22, 29 tells a person to be diligent in his business. Proverbs 11, 1 advises honesty and integrity in business. When Daniel was in Babylon, we're told in Daniel 8, 27, he was responsible for the king's business. The Apostle Paul worked in business making tents to meet his needs as a preacher. So what you want to do is vote for the candidate who approves what God approves and who disapproves what God disapproves. Number seven, citizenship. This includes voter ID, proof of United States citizenship if you're going to vote legally. You see, our Constitution has been said recently by the present Democratic uh, leadership that it's for all the people of the world. That's not true. Our Constitution is for our republic. It's not for all the people of the world. If all the people of the world want the benefits of our Constitution, they have to legally enter this country and apply for citizenship. It takes approximately two years to complete that process. It gives you time to think about what you're doing. Exodus 12, 18, and 19 required Israelites and non-Israelites to obey the same laws, which is not happening at the southern border, right? Exodus 12, 43 restricted non-Israelites from taking in the Passover unless they were converted to Judaism. Illegal aliens are not U.S. citizens. They do not have the same constitutional rights as a U.S. citizen. I stand here as a legitimate U.S. citizen. My rights are clearly defined in the Constitution. But somebody who sneaks across the border of my country is not a U.S. citizen. He is not protected by my Constitution. Matter of fact, he's condemned by it. He needs to be treated as a criminal. Boy, they don't like to hear that one, do they? Illegal aliens are not U.S. citizens. They do not have the same constitutional rights as U.S. citizens. Legal immigration requires submission to the established process of becoming a legitimate citizen of the United States by obeying the immigration laws. If you're violating the immigration laws, you're already a criminal. Pretty simple. Vote for the candidate who approves what God approves but who disapproves what God disapproves. Let's look at number eight and talk for a moment about a working class. The association of Engels with Karl Marx led to producing the Communist Manifesto, which promoted, as Barack Obama frequently said, spreading the wealth around. Now, Barack Obama wanted us to believe that spreading the wealth around the wealth around meant that everybody had all of the same amount of money and everything. That's not what it means if you read the Communist Manifesto. If you also read the, uh, the manifesto that the National Education Association has adopted, which is based upon the same thing, the Humanist Manifesto, what this does is it disguises government concern for the working class. So what does it really mean? It means you tax the working class more in order to feed the oligarchy ruling at the top. In other words, it's a socialistic, communistic platform is the idea behind it. You see, creation was God's work, Genesis 2, right? So God gave man work in the garden, Genesis 2.15. And by the way, work was assigned pre-fall. Work is not punishment for the fall. And then every living person in God's word is considered responsible to work. Work is honorable. So class distinctions are basically a Marxist concept. Class distinctions are an advantage to government control over the masses. 
if you can pit one class against another and distract them from what you and the government are doing to control both of them, that gives the government oligarchy. It gives them an advantage. So vote for what God approves and for what God disapproves when you pull the lever for a candidate. Number nine, economy and the size of government. <clears throat> Under socialism, the government must continue to grow so that it is a constant threat to the hardworking citizen. The word economy does not appear in the King James Bible, but the word prosper associated with economy in one of its forms does. The word, the Hebrew word, salach, means to push forward, to break out, to come forth mightily, to be materially effective, to be profitable. In other words, a person puts all of his energy into his work and all of the fruits of that energy are his to decide where they go and what to do with them. The word prosper is used to describe Joseph's work over Potiphar's house in Genesis 39.3. Historically, where Christianity has thrived on the mission field, material prosperity has accompanied it. The key to prosperity is limited government control over business and the working class. The key to prosperity is deregulation of our personal investments and business opportunities. Christians want to hide workers or want to hire workers who embrace and live by the principles of God's word. Read an article written by Ken Ham not too long ago where they had to go to court and fight for the right to hire only people who could sign their doctrinal statement to work on the ark. And the liberals wanted to take them to court. And it was led primarily by the ACLU, which is not American, not civil, not for liberty, and certainly not for unity. And yet it's called the American Civil Liberties Union. And so they filed suit against the Ark and held up construction for several months until the court ruled that Ken Ham had the right to hire only people who could sign the doctrinal statement to build the Ark. Because government doesn't want us to make decisions that aren't for the government's best interest. The unions fought that desperately for a long, long time. So the economy is affected by both government size and government effectiveness and management. And all of us know how effective government organizations are, right? <laughs> so presently, our government is so large that more people work for the government right now than work outside of the government and pay taxes to pay their salaries. <clears throat> in addition, government ineffectiveness is legendary. I think it was Ronald Reagan who said one time, he said one of the greatest lies that you will ever hear is someone who walks up to you and says, hello, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you number 10. I call this socialism. I have recognized for a long time that our country has gone socialistic. We are no longer a, a constitutional republic. As a matter of fact, almost all of the people that I hear speaking from the Biden administration refer to our country as a democracy. You start out as a republic with an absolute standard called the Constitution. When you degenerate to a democracy, you go what the largest number of people want to do. That's what destroyed one of the five things that destroyed Rome, according to Gibbon's rise and fall of the Roman Empire. It got to the place where uh, you just asked the people what they wanted to do. It's called Vox Populi, the Latin for voice of the people. And the people decided what they wanted to do. So Karl Marx and Engels sought to use the common man, the working class, as their resource for funding the oligarchy that would keep them in power. The oligarchy would take over the education system, indoctrinate succeeding generations to believe the oligarchy was always right, and would empower them to continue to carry out their program for the nation. Socialism is only one step away from communism. So the process is republic, democracy, cultural Marxism, and then communism. 
Cultural Marxism is the practical application of socialistic principles. So America was founded as a republic, which is governed by the Constitution. We degenerated into a democracy probably near the turn of the century and uh, the 20th century, or the 19th century, 1900 around that time. We degenerated into a democracy which is governed by what the largest number of people approve. And socialists will play to this. If you read 1984, the novel, what you will find in that and also in the, uh, the shorter they call Animal Farm, you'll find that the emphasis there is upon uh, um, educating the children and turning them against their parents, which is the right now, whenever a legal, not a legal, but a, um, a voting battle or, or running for office takes place in any state right now, the main issue at the front, along with the economy, the fact that we have the worst inflation in over four decades, the big issue now is the issue over who controls the education of the children. Well, when I was growing up, it was clear, the parents did. If I got in trouble at school, I got in trouble at home. And my parents always said when I came home with a complaint, well, you, you support your teacher, you know, your teacher can, uh, can teach you. But we become a socialistic state, and that's where the oligarchy, that's a small group of people. In our case, the oligarchy is not very small. Uh, when Trump ran for office and he said he wanted to drain the swamp, he wasn't talking just about Democrats. He was talking about uh, hardline Republicans that were old-line Republicans, you know. We're in power. When AOC uh, took a trip down into Texas, she complained at the fact that she wasn't treated with respect uh, by the, uh, the ice workers. Well, she needs to learn a lesson. She needs to be treating them with respect. She works for us. The people in office work for us. We don't work for them. So they have to do what we tell them to do. That's why we, we suffer when we leave the Constitution behind. So when you go to the polls on November the 8th, or if you decide to vote early, you can do that now by going online and checking the location. When you go to the polls November the 8th, vote for candidates most likely to approve what God approves and most likely to disapprove what God disapproves. As Sam comes to lead us, let's stand together, please.